Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Autogafuel. Today with me, AJ and Michelle. This weekend, we are here in the hills just outside of Mainz on a beautiful day. And we have with us the all new Opel Zafira Life, a new MPV which promises fun as well as practicality. But does it deliver? We'll find out, so stick around. The monocab MPV, the minivan, has been a dying segment in the past five to ten years. We all know this, of course, and that's been replaced by the compact SUV. But it's also interesting that the passenger van D segment actually has been growing in the same time. But the new customers demand more than just a big utilitarian boxy van. No, they want adventure, they want practicality, and they want luxury as well. Of course, style included. That's why the new Opel Zafira is now the Zafira Life and is a much bigger van. Up front, that also shows because we have a very flat snub nose out the front, very reminiscent of any of these passenger vans. You get Bison-on headlamps with LED daytime running lights, so no full LED option available. But I do like the design. You see how the, the wings for the Opel logo are integrated into the beginning of the headlamps as well very large Opel logo up front, a lot of chrome accents, again, to give that style and, um, you know, that luxury feeling that people expect from the new modern MPV. Um, further down, very functional air intakes, some more lamps and LED lights, very cool ice cube-like design for these LEDs as well. And a little bit of aggression and a little bit of a sporty touch with the sharp kink at the lower part of the bumper. The Zafira Life is 2.2 meters wide. Depending on the version you get, it is about 1,700 kilograms up to 1,900, 850 kilograms. This Zafira Life comes in three different lengths, built on two different platforms, or rather wheelbases, and all of them can be had with nine seats. The shorter version is 4.6 meters long and comes with the shorter wheelbase. Here we have the longer wheelbase version, and this is the middle level because this is five meters long there's also an elongated version which is 5.3 meters long but still built on the same platform or the wheelbase rather it's also interesting to note that this van is 1.9 meters tall and they've designed it in specifically this way so that it fits very easily in car parks even when you're going over humps and things like that there's plenty of clearance on the top so you don't have to be worried about that now this is also a little bit more of a vip business shuttle trim this is the version that we have in this dark gray color so it's again designed to be a little bit more luxurious and as a shuttle car rather than a long distance family van up front we have 17 inch dual tone alloy wheels which i think go very well with the rest of the color of this van very clean almost bland design on the side the Rear two windows, by the way, are completely fixed. As you can see, there are no sections where you can slide and they do not retract or you cannot uh, wind them down. So it's completely fixed. As we go all the way back to the end of the van, again, very straight cut back. So all in all, it still retains a very passenger MPV-like stance, but with the wheels, that little bit of chrome in the front and this color, it's trying to be a little bit more stylish. The back of the van is Again, very bland as well, I think. But in a way, I think it works for this design. It is very reminiscent of the other MPVs or vans in the segment, like the T6 or the, um, the Peugeot uh, Traveler. So very vertical tail lamps, cubic, as you can see, kind of like the ice cubes that we saw up front for the LED lights in the bottom. A large rear windshield. In fact, you can actually open this windshield as well. We'll show you that in a minute because you have the hinges just for that. But the entire hatch can be open. It is quite large, so you have to be careful in uh, tight parking areas that you don't smack into the car <laughs> on the side or just behind you. 
There is a reversing camera, although the quality is not the greatest. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. And a bumper with some parking sensors. So we have with us um, for today's test the medium length vehicle in the VIP business shuttle uh, trim line. All of these cars can also be had with the keyless entry, so now it's locked. I come close and touch the door handle, the door unlocks. Of course, wow, a <laughs> really tall door. You can see how many different door pockets we have all the way down here, um, where you can hide some items away. Uh, some more uh, cubby holes down here, one more little shelf up there. The materials, however, are a bit hard, I must be honest, even on the top. And we'll see later on when you're driving that actually you would tend to put your elbow right here since there is no dedicated armrest. And I wish this area was a little bit more plush. Um, but there is some interesting contrasting element like this shiny, glossy metal effect uh, plastic. On the top we have the window controls and the mirror adjustment. If we divert our attention now to the seats, well, depending on the trim line you have different options. Um, lower down in the trim line you do have some fabric options which we would prefer, but here in this version you do get the animal skin leather, um, unfortunately. But down here you can also see that you have different controls for um, adjusting the seats, so it's quite easy to find a comfortable seating position. You also have the optional massaging seat and you can vary the types of massage. You can increase or decrease the um, lumbar support and also we have the seat heater. So let me step inside. There's a step over here which makes it easier and a handle or actually no handle for the driver's seat which is quite common now but it is fairly easy to climb inside. They have also kind of thought about this, you know, for the, for the large family. Mom, dad, three kids, and grandma and grandpa. So with that in mind, the, uh, the ingress has also been tried, to, uh, has been tried to be optimized so that there isn't such a big climb um, into the cabin. So it's not that bad. Of course, you do feel like you're driving a very large vehicle. You do sit fairly up high. Um, you do have really good visibility and the dashboard is quite low. The materials, unfortunately, are still quite hard all around. Um, so somehow I do feel that they could have used a little bit more better materials. And even the fit and finish, like right here, you can see um, these different panel gaps are not the most optimum. But um, how about we sit inside and we take a closer look. This also comes with the heads up display, albeit it is a piece of flexiglass. Um, and then the image is projected on top of this plexiglass. But you have some different uh, interesting information like the speed. Uh, this also has a camera based traffic sign recognition. So it can give you the speed limit and other uh, warning symbols. You can of course adjust the height and the brightness of the uh, heads up display as well. The cockpit is fairly simple. You have analog dials for the tachometer, for the speedometer, a temperature gauge and a fuel gauge. In the middle you have a small screen which gives you some useful information such as you know your average consumption, time to empty, uh, sorry distance to empty and things like that which you can easily configure and scroll through and reset with the different options that you have. You can also of course as you see increase the brightness and decrease that if you wish. On the left hand side you have a dial for the IntelliGrip as you can see. This is actually kind of a software which optimizes the traction control that's the normal mode, then if you start scrolling this is for snow where you get a little bit of slippage that is allowed in order to dig the wheels into the snow to get more traction. Similarly for uneven surfaces and sand and you can turn it off completely. If you have the 4x4 version you will actually have the 4x4 dial here where you have the eco mode which is the two-wheel drive, front-wheel drive uh, mode. 
you will have a four-wheel drive mode, and then you have the rear differential lock mode. Over here, you also have the controls for the heads-up display in terms of the brightness and actually positioning it vertically so that it's in, in your line of sight. If we divert our attention further this way, the steering wheel actually I like. Um, when we're driving, I'll tell you a little bit more about it, but the grip is pretty good. The materials feel solid because we have the top of the range 177 horsepower 2 liter turbo 4 diesel engine with the 8 speed automatic. We do have paddle shifters behind the wheel. Interestingly, as you can see, it is mounted to the steering column and not to the steering wheel, so it doesn't turn with the wheel. On the left hand side, there's a stock for the intelligent cruise control or basically the adaptive cruise control. The Zafira Life has a camera and radar based a cruise control system wherein you can set the speed as well as the distance you want it to maintain with the car in front. There's some other buttons over here to navigate through the menus um, for the volume, your telephony controls and so on. As we go further towards the side, now we have the 7 inch display, the infotainment screen, which is a touch screen, which has some hotkey buttons around the side. We know, for example, with your uh, with the car logo, you can set up some of the uh, advanced assistance systems like the lane departure warning, um, the parking sensors. There's also a blind spot monitoring system and even a emergency pedestrian safety system where the car will detect there's a pedestrian crossing in the front and automatically initiate an emergency braking system if you like. This overall system is not the best. Unfortunately, I'm not too happy with it. It is not the slickest to respond and the screen is a bit small in comparison with the rest of the dashboard. I think they could have done with a little bit of a bigger screen and overall it doesn't seem as slick. So for example, if I go to the options here, it takes a minute, you know, for the Sometimes it doesn't register the click or it takes a couple seconds for it to be um, for it to come up. But on the whole, it's fairly useful, uh, useful uh, and usable. You also have, as you saw, a, uh, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. So you can connect your phone and that's also quite easy and straightforward anyway. There's also a volume knob and a power button. So it's easy to uh, control that rather than trying to use the touchscreen. Climate control over here, there is one, uh, two zones in the front and uh, another zone in the back. Very straightforward. Um, you can also have, we can see there's the buttons for the sliding rear doors. And I'll show you that there's also a cool um, the automatic foot gesture that you can use to open these doors. Start stop button, a cubby hole to keep your phone, although this is not an inductive charging port. There is one USB port here. But I think they could have provided a few more USB ports. There's, of course, a 12 volt power socket and some more I'll show you in a minute. But um, some of these dummies could have been USB ports nevertheless. But what I do like and what is also very <laughs> van-like is the, the, um, the gear lever, or rather the dial, is right here within the center console. So there's not, it's liberating all that empty space um, in between the seats. Of course, as you can see, parking reverse neutral drive and the M button to initiate the manual mode wherein then you can take control of the gearbox by using the paddle shifters. And finally, a lot of storage, cubby hole on the top, a glove box over here. Although this is not damped or spring loaded, so it does feel a bit flimsy, but it at least you probably get some more uh, storage space and this is felt line so that is a little bit nicer. You also have down here a damped glove box with another 12 volt power socket and of course lots of door pockets around. Getting into the back of the Zafira Life is also easy thanks to the foot controlled sliding rear doors for the left and the right. So it opens up automatically. Again depending on the version we have the VIP business shuttle. Inside as you can see being a passenger van in the D segment, there is ample room. I mean, you can get this with the Flex 7, 8 or Flex 9 uh, seating arrangement. Right here now we actually have the captain seat, so this is a six seat arrangement. Um, you can also get the face-to-face vis-a-vis -face, uh, -vis seats where you actually rotate these seats to face uh, each other. But right now, let's just check it out as it is. You do have a handle back here to get inside. Let me go to the far end so you can see a little bit better. 
with these seats, you have a lot of options. Of course, you have a ratchet for the armrest, so you can set the height that you want, a sunshade that you can have. Um, also, a kind of a split panoramic sunroof, so the center console, or rather the center of the roof is still uh, housing the air vents and a third climate zone up here. So there's that's where you have vents, but it's nice to see that you have vents one, two, three. So three sets running all the way back. So even the passengers in the back are well catered to. Net to keep some magazines. Also a little tray table uh, with a little bit of an indentation to keep a cup, although I'm sure this would not be enough to um, hold any kind of bottle. It's too shallow, but there's also a little strap maybe for you to strap the back of your iPad case so that you can watch some TV and some videos on the go. But there's also a center console down here, which <laughs> comes up like that on its own. Here you do have slightly larger uh, beverage holders and also if I move my seat back a bit, you can see here there is these tray tables that retract out. And in this way, this is pretty useful. In fact, if you do have the seats facing each other, you can have this table in between the two seats, uh, or rather the two rows. So you have like a table um, in between the two seats facing each other. And that way, if it's for work or if you have kids sitting back here and they want to talk to each other or play some games, it's a very nice place to be because it really you're able to connect with your passengers. Well, apart from that, there are some more storage possibilities like down here, a very cavernous and deep storage area, which also can be covered away. There's also a 220 volt plug socket so you can charge your laptop depending on the version you have you have the option of having these uh, plug sockets in other areas of the van so it's easier to access all of these seats and even the center uh, table console are all on these railings as you can see so it's very easy to slide them forward and backwards and set them in a position where you can uh, find them the most useful and of course these seats can also be reclined a little bit so that the passengers find a comfortable position and with one switch very easily tumble it so that you can access the third row. So back here, same thing, the seats can also be slid forward on these railings to liberate more say, uh, space for the, um, the luggage compartment area. You can also recline the seat a little bit more. There's also this grab handle to get inside, making it easier. Air conditioning vents as well as a light. And some of these kind of um, uh, these 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 dummies that you see here, for example, could have the uh, 230 volt, 220 volt plug socket, so it's easier to uh, plug in your phones and your smartphones and chargers for your laptop. But you also have a 12 volt power socket, regardless. So there's plenty of versatility and adaptability to really use the space back here really well. Of course, you have up to six Isofix. Uh, anchor points or rather seats with isofix anchor points so if you have a very large family you have plenty of places as you can see all of these four seats have isofix points but um, all the versions have plenty of them um, so it's really easy to cater to all of your family needs AJ, can you open the trunk because i forgot my sunglasses you forgot your sunglasses did you leave them on the parcel shelf yes i did well thankfully there's a fear of life has the ability to open just the glass and not the entire tailgate and you can retrieve your cameraman's sunglasses that he forgot. Thank you. But of course you can use this button down there to release the entire tailgate. This is quite massive so you have to be pretty careful when you're opening this in car parks. But depending on the way you have your seats configured, the maximum amount of volume with this medium uh, length on the longer wheelbase version of the Zafir Life, you can get up to 4,200 liters of trunk space. That's plenty to carry all the different items. I have been quite generous with the leg rooms that I'm providing for these four seats. That's why there is not so much space down here. But just to give you an idea, a standard um, cabin baggage would fit in, you know, flat and sideways. Uh, within the back of this trunk. But of course you do have the ability from back here as well to slide the seats forward and that way you can 
liberate more volume without having to step back. There's some lights over here, but very simple, plain loading area. There's nothing below this, um, but you do have some anchor points and you have the, the option to use this to access the, um, the spare wheel. You can make that drop down. On the whole, because it gives you the flexibility to do what you want with the space, I like it, you know, if you don't need to have so many spaces, uh, so much space for the seats, or if you don't need um, so many seats in the first place, you can get rid of them, move them forward, and then use this as a van to carry your mountain bikes, um, your tents, any large items, your surfboards. So it is a very versatile lifestyle vehicle. And this is a two liter turbo four cylinder engine. It can be either had in the tune of 150 horsepower, metric horsepower or PS, or 177 like the one we have right here. You can also get a smaller 1.5 liter turbo four diesel engine, which can be either had with 102 horsepower or 120 horsepower. All of these engines uh, and tunes can be had with the six speed manual transmission, but the big one, the 177 like the one we have here, comes coupled with the eight-speed torque converter automatic gearbox. They are all transversely mounted and go only to front wheel drive. But you can also get the Dangel 4x4 conversion for this van, wherein you would have the on-demand coupling, which would provide torque and drive to the rear axle, thus making it a four-wheel drive vehicle. All of these engines are Euro 6 D-Temp ready, so that means that they also have a lot of um, treatment after treatment for the exhaust gases to reduce the carbon monoxide um, and a lot of other filtering systems so they are future ready. But if you don't want a diesel engine you can wait till 2021 when they will have the full electric version of this vehicle. We're going to start off our drive with the new Zafira Live out on the highway so we can test the mannerisms of this large passenger van where it will probably spend the most amount of its time. So first of all, let's talk about the engine and a good way to test it is now coming onto the on-ramp up into the highway to see how much acceleration we can get out of this two liter engine. Put my foot down, the eight speed automatic shifts fairly quickly and smoothly. There's pretty good torque to push you forward and to get you up to speed without too much of a fuss. Um, if you do wish, maybe on a little bit more of a twisty road, even though this is a big van, you can have it in the manual mode, wherein you can quickly shift up and down with the paddle shifters that you have on the steering column. And I must say, it does shift pretty quickly and very seamlessly. We'll see if there's an opportunity to test this out in a little bit more detail further on. Apart from that, the engine itself is very smooth. The engine has been designed, this 2-liter engine, with uh, also has things like variable uh, geometry for the turbo. It also has a balancing, sha uh, uh, yeah, balancing shaft so that it is a little bit more refined. It is not as grumbly as you would generally think um, and, or general diesel engines sometimes tend to be. That way it's pretty good. These very large Rear view mirrors also give you plenty of view out the side because they're slightly taller, so it provides pretty good visibility. In terms of visibility in general, of course, there's very high seating position, pretty large windshield up front, really tall windows, a large tailgate in the back, so there's plenty of visibility all around, so you can place this car very easily. Now, let's talk a little bit about the driving position because there's somehow, I'm not so satisfied with it. There's something that seems a bit odd about it. First of all, my knee is constantly hitting the center console, which initially I felt, okay, is uncomfortable, but now I'm kind of using it as a way for me to rest my leg against that, which is pretty comfortable in the end, but just you test that out and see how you feel about it in, uh, when you do a long test drive. But the pedals, especially the brake pedal, seems a bit too close to me because now I have the seat in a little bit of a higher position so I can see out front much nicer and much more easier. And then the brake, uh, sorry, the accelerator pedal is positioned really well. It's right at the 
the tip of my foot so I can uh, comfortably manipulate the throttle but the brake pedal is significantly further back and higher than the, the throttle pedal so I kind of have to it's, it's a bit of a twist that I have to perform in order to get the get my foot on the brake pedal and consequently I end up hitting the brakes a little bit too hard than I than I would have liked to and kind of starts jerking the car because I'm braking too hard so I don't know maybe it's something that you can get used to but I don't think it's that ergonomic I think because uh, I am it's a bit too close forward to me similarly the steering wheel for some reason you know I've spent some time trying to figure out if it was something that I was doing wrong or if uh, I was you know perhaps you know sitting in a different position but um, the truth is it does feel like it is a little bit off center so if I'm sitting straight ahead the steering wheel should be a little bit to the left but it's instead it's a little bit further to the right and that kind of makes me seem feel like I'm, I'm sitting you know I'm leaning to the right a little bit and also twisting a little bit so the steering wheel and the brake pedal somehow perhaps to my body size and height it doesn't really seem to be that comfortable um, I can probably try to spend more time with the seat and try to fix that but I would recommend that you check it out as well but apart from that the seats are very comfortable you do have adjustment for the lumbar support although it is a it is a little bit different you don't have the regular control system where you can you know increase and decrease and position vertically where you want the lumbar support to be it's kind of like an oscillating you know a single button where you hold it and then the lumbar support comes out and goes away so if you miss the level where you want it to be you have to go through a full cycle of extension and retraction and try to catch it at the right minute uh, where it is in the right amount so it is seems a bit budget to me some of the other technology in this car also seems a little bit budget to me as well like the heads-up display we've seen this in a lot of other Opel cars before like the the Grandland X that uh, we drove some time ago you know it's it's you have this this plexiglass on which the heads-up display is projected not on the windshield itself this infotainment system is really seems a bit dated it seems like a generation too old so similarly this lumbar support you don't have it's just one button and it's not the most optimized but you have the massage you have the seat heater so in the end it does redeem itself but you still have you know very typical van like ergonomics you have the large handbrake lever right next to the seat that you can just yank up it feels like a big van which it is a lot of empty space here between the two passenger seats again uh, very van like because it is a van and even things like the where windows don't move you can't retract them you can't open you can't slide a part of it it's just a fixed glass window for the sides so that way some of the things seem a little bit on the budget side including some of the materials here and speaking of which you know this door the top part of the door is you know height wise is in a nice position uh, and a nice height for you to rest your elbow on but unlike the right side first of all it's not in the same height and secondly whereas this is a nice padded armrest which is part of the seat the left side isn't and you don't have an armrest on the left side of the seat so you would end up putting your arm there and it is it is a very hard plastic there is no padding at all so some of these things seem a bit um, seem a bit like they could be improved but there is some uh, useful technology to make long drives on the highway more comfortable for example we have the um, cruise control so I can set it by pressing the button here on this right here and then with that I can set a speed that I want it to maintain and then I can also set a distance that I want it to maintain with the car in front and in this way if the car in front of me slows down the, and the car will my car will also slow down to maintain that safe distance with the car in front and then if that car pulls away it will speed up again and reach that speed that I had initially set so this way it's really comfortable you also have active lane keeping assist so it will steer the car in case there is uh, you know if it's going out of lane you can also deactivate that if you don't want it to do that so all in all some of these uh, features we see in pretty much all the cars nowadays but people expect this right people expect a new car to have these kinds of features and in that way at least this kind of technology is pretty much uh, taken care of
There are also some other features, like for example, you have the SOS button, so you have um, the connectivity, where if you're in an emergency, you can use that button to a signal for help uh, directly without having to use your phone or something like that. It also has traffic sign recognition with the camera, which you can see on the heads-up display, so you can see in your line of sight how fast you're going and what the speed limit is, which is really nice. The steering wheel itself has a very slow rack, which means that it is a very slow uh, uh, reacting steering wheel. You do have to turn quite a bit for, the, for, uh, for you to get uh, any kind of steering input. But the plus side is it feels really planted on the highway and on open roads because, you know, even a small movement doesn't really upset the stability of the car. Speaking of stability in general, it is very planted. Even though it is fairly tall, it, is, it feels quite uh, sure-footed on the, on the highway, that, as we saw. Um, the sound insulation is pretty good. Yes, it is a very tall, boxy van, and that means that it is not the most aerodynamic, and hence you're going to have a little bit more wind noise. But all that being considered, it is definitely pretty hushed, I would say. The smooth engine, and there's very little tire noise, and the wind noise is also quite minimized. In fact, Opel has done quite a lot to try to minimize the sound overall. They've added a lot of padding and um, use special acoustic glass in order to reduce the NVH levels, uh, which is the noise, vibration and harshness levels within the cabin. So on the whole, it is pretty good. I'm getting about 7.3 liters for 100 kilometers, which is what a number that I would expect from this diesel engine. So it is pretty efficient as well. And like I mentioned, if you do want to take control with the paddle shifters, you do have that ability and the 8-speed automatic is really quite smooth. I'm actually quite happy with this 8-speed uh, torque converter. It is very slick and very uh, subtle. You barely notice that it's changing up and down. Around this bend over here, you know, just at 70 kilometers per hour, of course I do feel quite a bit of body roll, but that is to be expected. But again, because of this tall body, you do get really good visibility. It takes a little bit of getting used to, you know, with the larger amount of steering input that you have to provide. The brakes are also pretty good. You have disc brakes all around and it's pretty sure-footed. It's a very gradual bite, albeit the pedal placement, like I mentioned earlier, is not the best. In terms of maneuverability, you do have a 360 degree, sorry, you do have a backup camera and a top-down camera, but here as well, the technology just seems a little bit on the budget side. It's the, the graphics on the display for the backup camera is, again, a generation too old, and even the, the top-down view is some kind of a, kind of like a, you know, it doesn't have a live top-down view, it kind of records the, uh, the, the area behind the car as you back up and then tries to render that visually around the car. It's hard to explain, but the point is it, it's, not the, it's not the best system out there. It seems a little bit budget. So I don't know why they've skipped out on things like this. Yes, it is a much more affordable proposition than say the T6, um, but I think they could have gone that little bit extra or given you the option as well to, to upgrade to some more advanced systems for this kind of uh, tech. But on the whole, the seats are comfortable. The suspension is also very compliant. Allows for enough roll, you know, but at the same time maintains uh, some rigidity at least and some stiffness. The engine is really responsive. I think the engine and gearbox combination so far is my favorite part of this car. Steering rack is, like I mentioned, a bit slow um, and technology could have been a little bit better. But on the whole, for a family car, this is definitely a great alternative. Let's also take a look at how the van is to drive in city spaces. Although it does seem fairly big on the outside, and definitely it is a pretty big car, um, the volume that you feel on the inside is just because of the very clever boxy packaging. And on the outside, it is actually fairly reasonably sized, and it is fairly easy to maneuver. So in these beautiful, narrow little village streets here, near the uh, near mines, um, it is fairly easy to maneuver. I've never found, like for example, there's a big tractor next to me. There's plenty of room, no problem at all. By the way, this does not have the steering intervention. I, I just checked again. This just has a lane departure warning alert system. But even in the city, this uh, engine is always maintaining a low RPM. It's a, got a very 
uh, you know, very supple throttle response. It's not necessarily very sharp. And the gearbox is also very smart. It shifts up much sooner. So you get pretty good mileage. Even in city sp speeds like this, I'm still getting about 7.7 .7 liters for 100 kilometers in the city. Um, so it's a pretty frugal engine. The steering, however, you know, because it's a slow rack, first of all, it does feel a little bit heavier and you just have to be aware that if you're going to be doing a lot of steering, it can feel a bit heavy and a little bit of, uh, a little bit laborious at times. But again, it's just, it's just inherent in the size of the vehicle. But that being said, you know, it doesn't weigh that much. So it does feel very easy on its feet. It doesn't feel like it's going to bulldoze something. You can also see the lane departure warning beeping. Sometimes it beeps unnecessarily, so it's not the most perfect system, but it is definitely useful. A nice alerting system as well um, when you're on the highway uh, to make sure that if you're distracted by, again, if you have six kids in the back, you're not uh, losing your focus on the road. And it's always there as a safety net for you to fall back on. Now let's take a few minutes to check out the all-wheel drive version of the Zafira Life. So the all-wheel drive version is not available with all the engine transmission options. So for example, you don't get it with the 8-speed automatic. We have with us the 150 horsepower 2-liter turbo 4 diesel engine with the 6-speed manual and this all-wheel drive conversion. Now the Opel brand, as you may know, is owned by PSA. And PSA has a long-standing partnership with a off-road um, conversion company called Dangel, which is a French company. So that's why we have here the Dangel 4x4 conversion badge. So this means that, first of all, Opel itself raises the ride height by 20 millimeters, but then Dangel raises it another 40 millimeters. So now we have 60 millimeter extra ground clearance. The front wheel drive transverse engine mounted layout then gets a viscous coupling um, from the transaxle which runs through all the way back to the rear differential. The rear, rear differential also has a lock so you can lock the rear differential when you perhaps let's say have uh, one of the wheels off the ground and of course you don't want that wheel to be getting all the power and then you won't go anywhere so there's a rear differential lock as well. Apart from that under uh, under the car, the underbody also has um, aluminium panels which will protect the engine, the transmission, the drive shaft, and the fuel tank so that when you're going, perhaps you're, you're breaking over a crest, the, um, the ground doesn't scrape and puncture or rupture any of these vital components. So this way, it is pretty cool. You can think of it like an adventure mobile. You know, you can have your whole family, everybody's out having a good time, and you can explore some of these dirt tracks in the woods and be rest assured that you're not going to get stuck anywhere and you're not going to damage the body. All right, let's put it into first gear. So since we don't have the eight-speed automatic, um, I don't think it's such a big deal. Uh, manuals are quite popular here in Europe anyway. But what's important is I have the uh, knob here on the left-hand side and I'm going to turn it into four-wheel drive mode. There's also the four-wheel drive with the rear axle lock. Which, let's see, we might need it, we might not need it. Now the viscous coupling is engaged. So the viscous coupling basically has multiple plates which have tabs and holes. Ooh, <laughs> very steep downhill. I can hear the, the underbody protection scraping the, uh, the ground a little bit, but that's good because it means that that aluminium plate is taking the, the, the force and not the engine or the fuel tank. So anyway, the viscous coupling has perforated plates and tabbed plates, and they're packed very close to each other in a, in a, in a drum. Now, there's a very thick viscous fluid, silicone-based generally, and when the front axle and the rear axle spin at the same speed, the plates are spinning also in, a very, in the same speed, and hence the fluid, that viscous fluid, is very cool. But when there's a little bit of difference between the front axle and the rear axle, the difference in the speed creates a difference in the plates and that friction generates heat and just that enough heat is enough to make that viscous fluid really dense and almost as like a solid and because it becomes so solid the um, 
the plates are kind of glued together and hence that differential that that uh, the coupling is engaged and that's how the power gets transmitted to the rear axle so it's a little bit different we have a lot of these different kinds of uh, technologies for converting a transverse front wheel drive vehicle uh, and converting that into an all-wheel drive so this is one of them the steering is also really slow the rack is very slow which is fine because it is a van but that also means that I have very nice precise control when going off-road like this truth be told so far I haven't found any need for this all-wheel drive system because we're in the dry but if this was wet then that's when this all-wheel drive would really help out because we would need all that traction. That viscous coupling also ensures that the rear axle is, uh, is engaged when you're going downhill if you leave it in first gear. That kind of automatically provides this hill descent control kind of a thing. But I must say the suspension, you know, with that 60 millimeter lift is also really useful. It's a little bit more supple and that extra ground clearance is definitely helping traverse this kind of um, a tricky situation. Now we are about to go under a bridge through some really muddy, muddy scenario, uh, like this really muddy um, trench here. And I'm going to, woo, <laughs> there we go. Just keep the engine revving a little bit higher, let the clutch slip a little bit so there's enough exhaust gases coming out of the exhaust pipe. And so that way there's no scope for any of these to be uh, any water to be going inside the exhaust pipe and then this is pretty good so this is exactly where that all-wheel drive system helps out that slushy muddy kind of a terrain is really tricky to traverse with only a front wheel drive car there's also plenty of locks that I can get with this I'm going to back up a little bit um, but there's it's pretty maneuverable this area also is really interesting because now we're going to have one wheel which is off the ground. So now I'm going to also straighten out and engage the rear differential lock. So for this, I'm going to rotate this. And now the rear differential is locked and it's giving me this beep, which is telling me that the rear differential is locked because you don't want to keep it that way for long because it's, it's going to start scrubbing the tires if you're turning. Um, and I'm going to navigate through these two logs over this little bridge. That was pretty fun, very useful. And this continuous beep is reminding me that, hey, your four wheel drive lock, your rear differential lock is still on. I'm gonna leave it on as, until I get down this little hill. That was pretty cool. And I'm going to turn it off now. So now the rear wheel lock, uh, rear differential lock has been deactivated. As we make our way, through the rest of this really fun course. I don't need to go into second gear. It's a very slow track, but this goes to show as a proof of concept that you can take this Zafira life if you get the Dangel 4x4 conversion on some fun family adventures. And that kind of makes it like a adventure mobile for your entire family. So I must say, Similar to the T6 that Michelle and I, we actually tested that a couple years ago, um, also pretty close to Frankfurt. We had the Panamericana and the Roxton, or the Rockton, I think it was called, which also had a different kind of an all-wheel drive system, the Haldex Borg Warner um, multi-plate coupling. Um, but this is similar to that, and I think this is pretty fun. So, off-road, check. Let's summarize today's episode of the all-new Opel Zafira Life. Well, with prices starting at around 35000 for the small wheelbase version with pretty basic amenities, I think that's a pretty good deal for a nine-seat family MPV. But if you go for the slightly larger one, either the M, like the one we have here, the middle level, or the larger full-long wheelbase um, version, you can even touch 48 or 50,000 euros. But again, if you're easy on the configurator, you can still get a pretty good price for one of these cars, or rather <laughs> vans, should I say. So all in all, I think it has a really good price value proposition, but that also means that unfortunately, there are some areas where I find that there's just a bit of too much of uh, cost cutting. 
Some of the plastics and the materials used, I think, should have been a little bit better, at least on the armrest, on the door, for example. I don't really mind the, the hard plastics on the top of the dash. I know that you can live with it quite easily, but the, where you keep your elbow on the door should be a little bit more padded. Also, some of the technology, I think, should also be upgraded. I think it's not really um, up to date with the current generation of the infotainment systems we see from some of its competitors. I think the touchscreen is a little bit slow. The rear parking camera is also not the, the clearest. That top-down 360 view is also not really the most advanced. And the seating position somehow to me seemed a bit awkward and not too bad after a weekend of driving I got used to it but it kept reminding me that okay things are a little bit different here than the cars I usually drive. So make sure that if you're going to be interested in one of these cars take a test drive long enough for you to try out all of these seating positions and find a way if you can be really comfortable with the way the brake pedal is placed and with the way the steering wheel feels a little bit off center. But that being said for this price point with that all-wheel drive version available, it does seem like a really fun family adventure wagon. And I think that's what is also really appealing about vehicles such as this. On the other side as well, for having a very luxurious VIP business shuttle like the one we have here, I think it also has a great market for that as well. I'm curious to see how well these sell. Let me know what you think in the comments below. As always, thanks for watching. Subscribe if you're new here. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook. And I'll see you guys next time.